Oke, okay. good evening America, good morning Indonesia. Welcome to the webinar of Bincang Karya or in In English, it's Creation Talk. I'm Poppy Rufaida, Educational and Cultural Attaché at the Indonesian Embassy in Washington DC and as a session chair for today webinar. So this webinar will be conducted in English in the first hour and then in Bahasa Indonesia in the second hour. This webinar will be uh, Uh, conducted uh, for nearly two, hour, uh, two hours. So before the talk begins, let's see a short video of the webinar. Thank you. We would like to invite Professor Nijam, the Director of General from uh, Higher Education from Ministry of Education, uh, Culture, Research, and Technology, Republic of Indonesia. Professor Nizam. Uh, uh, Professor Nizam maybe will be represented by Professor Faisal. Yeah. I'm sorry, Professor Nizam and the minister is uh, has another meeting. Sorry, so I will represent Professor Nizam and the Minister of uh, Education. Is it okay? Please. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Indonesia, and good evening in USA. Uh, His Excellency Bapak Rusan Ruslani, Indonesian Ambassador to the US, Bapak Andin Hadianto, President Director of LPDB, Indonesian Endowment Fund for Education, Professor Poppy Rufaida, Atasa for Education and Culture, the Embassy of the Republic of Indonesia in Washington, D.C., all of the invited speakers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Minister of Education, Culture, Research, and Technology, I would like to express our highest appreciation to the Indonesian Embassy in Washington, D.C. for successfully holding the webinar series of Bianca, Pincang Karya or Creation Talks, with the topics of postdoctoral fellowship and graduate program in USA. We hope the Creation Talks could achieve the vision for the postdoctoral fellowship program to improve the collaborative network between universities for, from Indonesia and the United States in offering more postdoctoral fellowship and improve the, the apprehension and understanding of the stakeholders and for the graduate program to convey the latest research development and scientific development in masters and doctoral programs and to increase the interest of Indonesian to pursue master and doctoral studies in the United States. And I would like uh, also to <clears throat> warmly welcome and congratulate invited professors and speakers from Harvard University and University of Michigan and all of the webinar participants from Indonesia and abroad. The Directorate General for Higher Education, Research and Technology uh, of the Republic of Indonesia support the research funding from basic research, applied research to development research. <clears throat> With a total research fund for this year is up to 85 million US dollar. 
In addition, the potential for research downstreaming can continue to be developed through the matching fund scheme with Kedereka platform with available fund of up to 70 million US dollar. Aside of competitive fund and, uh, and matching fund for product downstreaming, uh, the Directorate General for Higher Education, Research and Technology also encouraged massive involvement of students to take part in MBKM program, Emancipated Learning Independent Campus by Certified Internship Program in Industry and Independent Studies, Village Development, Research, and Indonesian International Student Mobility Award to fund Indonesian students from Ford Mobility Program at top university overseas. Undergraduate student could spend one semester at the overseas university partner to study, to experience the host country's culture and undertake practical assignment to home their skills. Uh, last, last year, there were more than 80,000 students who participated in the Campus Merdeka program, and it is expected that this year it will increase to 100,000 students, which 40% uh, of the students involved are digital talents, we will later bring progress to the nation in the field of technology. Hopefully, this webinar will run, will run smoothly and be successful to improve the collaborative network in education, research, science, and technology between universities and educational institutions from Indonesia and the US, and to increase the number of Indonesian pursuing master's and doctoral studies in the United States and on scholarships. Thank you very much. Uh, I will bring back to the chairman, Professor Poppy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Faisal, for the remark from Ministry of Education, Culture, Research, and Technology, the Republic of Indonesia. We would like to invite the Honorable uh, Ambassador, uh, Rosan Ruslani, to uh, deliver the remark. Thank you, Ibu Poppy. Uh, distinguished uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to the webinar on how to get a postdoctoral fellowship in USA. And please uh, let me acknowledge some very uh, important person also, Pak Andin Hadianto, the President Director of LPDP, Pak Dwi Larso, uh, also Professor Jamal Biwoho, Chairman of Council of Rector of Indonesian State Universities, uh, Professor Faisal, uh, and also uh, Professor Ming Yan Yu, Peter and Evelyn Fast, Chair of Electrical and Computer Engineering, uh, and also Luan Posey, PhD, the Program Manager of uh, Harvard Medical School. Uh, ladies, and, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Indonesian Embassy in Washington, D.C. has, uh, scheduled, has scheduled serial webinar activities, namely Bincang Karya and abbreviated as uh, Bianca, or in English mean creation talks. The aim of the webinar are to increase cooperation in the field of education, research, science, and technology with the partner universities and educational institutions in the United States, and to increase the preference of Indonesia to study in the US with Indonesian government scholarship and other source of funding. The first webinar in 2022 is scheduled in providing the change for Indonesia to get postdoctoral fellowship in USA. The second and the rest of the webinar that consists of 17 webinars are aimed to provide information about scholarships and research collaboration with the U.S. universities. There are 47 fields of study, a research topic that will be presented from 42 U.S. universities. These are supported by dean, postgraduate directors or head of study programs and students, master and doctoral supervisors. The webinar of Bianca was carried out in collaboration with LPDP and the Council of Rectors of Indonesian State University uh, Majelis Rektor Perguruan Tinggi Negeri Indonesia. The webinar activity has been held since 2020, July to December, as many as uh, 13 series. In 2021, August to December, as many as 10 series. And 2022, March to July, as many as 18 series. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that by participating in this webinar, we are in the right place and at the right time. Together, let, let us accelerate the exchange of ideas and scaling up of good practices. I am especially pleased that the discussions and the activities here will inform latest information. I, I encourage all of you to attend whole serial webinar. I'm confident that you will find new ideas and novel partnerships. I wish you all a very successful webinar. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Honorable uh, Ambassador Rosan, for uh, delivering the remark from Indonesian Embassy in Washington, D.C. We would like to invite uh, Dr. Andin Hadianto, President Director mm -hmm. of Indonesia Endowment Fund for Education, the Ministry of Finance, the Public of Indonesia. Please welcome uh, Dr. Andin. Thank you very much, Ibu Bopi. Good evening, USA. Good morning, Indonesia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The Honorable Excellencies, uh, Mr. Rosan Ruslani, the Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to the United States of America, Professor Faisal, uh, Director General of Higher Education, Research and Technology, Minister of Education of Indonesia, Professor Bobby Rupaida, Educational and Cultural Attaché at the Indonesian Embassy, Washington, D.C., Honorable Speakers, uh, Postdoc Fellows, or colleagues from LPDP, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend my gratitude to Professor Bobby with the full support and guidance of Ambassador Rosan Ruslani for the initiative to hold a webinar series, Bianca with today's topic, how to get postdoctoral fellowship in USA. I would also like to thank all the speakers for this webinar who have been willing to share their expertise, knowledge, and inspire other Indonesian students. Indonesian Human Funds for Education, or well known as LPDP, was initiated in 2010 and in operation since 2012 and has given mandate to manage and develop endowment funds, initially about one billion US dollar. Then we use the return of the investment for scholarship and research grants. As time by and the trust of the government raised significantly, LBDB gets additional government budget allocation for endowment funds almost every year. And recently in total, we manage about 6.9 billion US dollar. In terms of services, from 2013 up to now, LBDP has already granted 29,872 awardees. Two thirds of those awardees are in magister programs. The rest are doctoral, medical specialty, and thesis dissertation grantees. More than 5,800 are ongoing awardees and about 13,400 are alumni. LBD awardees come from all areas of Indonesia, and we try our best to promote LBDP scholarship equally in collaboration with local universities, local governments, and civil societies. We also provide affirmative actions in less developed areas, especially in the eastern part of Indonesia. Until now, LBDB has sent 1,164 awardees to the USA. Among others, 1,047 are in master programs and 117 awards are in doctoral programs. Ladies and gentlemen, the pandemic has impacted LBDB operations in 2020, but in 2021, we bounced back and managed to provide record-breaking number of awards granted, up to 4,266 4, from native LPDP programs and more than 2,100 from collaborative programs with the Ministry of Education of Indonesia. In this 2022, LPDP is aiming at granting more numbers of awards through an additional collaboration with other ministries, including Ministry of Religious Affairs. LBDP scholarship programs are in three main categories. First is affirmative programs. This uh, program for disabled and lower income peoples and less developed regions. Second, targeted programs. Uh, this program for civil servants, military, police, and entrepreneurs and the third uh, general public scholarship programs. Recently, a new program is affirmative scholarship for people of Papua and West Papua provinces. This program is a breakthrough to boost recruitment of Papuans for scholarships in order to further support the socioeconomic development in these two provinces. 
Ladies and gentlemen, of course, postdoctoral program is a continuation of conducting research activities after completion of a doctoral degree. This program is excellent in many ways, including continuation for the research efficiently, allowing new graduates to acquire new experience in leading research projects, expanding research network wider, joining a research project relevant to a research national agenda, and increasing journal publications. LBDB has supported the postdoctoral programs as well as sabbatical leave program for educators and researchers through a collaborative program with the Ministry of Education. Last year, 20 postdoc and 76 sabbatical leave awards are granted. This year, 40 awards for the postdoc and 100 awards for sabbatical leave are to be granted. I'm sure that many of them are going to the USA for their postdoc research. This webinar certainly will increase the opportunities for more Indonesians to do postdoc research in the USA, especially in the two top American universities, Harvard University and University of Michigan. Congratulations to the organizer of the webinar. Thank you for the initiative and for inviting LPDP to join and support this event. We hope that operation among American and Indonesian universities and governments grows further in the area of human capital development and research. Two very important areas that two countries can form a mutual cooperation. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Andin, for a specific and very special uh, remark, the opportunity for us to earn the postdoctoral fellow uh, under Indonesian uh, government support. We would like to invite the last but not least, the opening remark from the uh, Council of Rector of Indonesian State University, Professor Muhammad Asari, uh, the rector of uh, ITS in Surabaya. Uh, is Jawa Jaffa. Please welcome. Okay, terima kasih, Ibu. Uh, good morning, Indonesia, and good evening, USA, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, Excellency Prof. Faisal from Minister of Education, Culture, Research, and Technology of Republic Indonesia. Excellency, uh, the Ambassador of Republic Indonesia to USA, Bapak uh, Rosan Ruslani. Uh, also, uh, uh, Bapak Andin Hadianto dan Bapak Dwi Larso, the President Director of LB, LPDB. And also, uh, special my friend, Professor Popi Rufaida, the Atasa of uh, Educational uh, Culture, Embassy of Republic Indonesia, and all the honorable speakers and distinguished audience. Uh, on behalf of uh, the chairman of uh, Council of Rector of Indonesia State University, or we call it Kraisu, in Bahasa Indonesia, we call it uh, Majelis Rector Perguruan Tinggi Negeri, uh, MRPTN, uh, the chairman now is Professor Jamal Wiwoho, but I would like to, uh, on behalf of uh, Professor Jamal, would like to uh, express our gratitude, uh, especially to the Embassy of uh, Republic Indonesia to US, especially uh, Excellency Bapak Rosan and Ibu Professor Popi for actively conducting uh, webinar, including Bianca 24th today, this event. This is a very valuable, valuable uh, for Indonesia human capital improvement. Uh, uh, Dr. Ilham, uh, the executive director of Kraisu or Majelis Raptor, is also with us today. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, since uh, the program launched by Mas Menteri, uh, Mr. Nadim, uh, which is uh, Merdeka Belajar Kampus Merdeka or we call it MBKM, uh, universities in Indonesia are more open-minded, more ex intensively creating a collaboration with abroad. Yeah? Student mobility, international guest lecture, etc. 
is in, increased significantly. So at the moment, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in Indonesia, currently there are more than 9 million university students and more than 293,000 academic staff or lecturers. And also uh, in Indonesia, there are more than 4,500 higher education institution. So uh, uh, all of them are working together, finding creative ways to improve the quality of the institution, staff, and also students. And Kraisu, uh, Council of Rector uh, of Indonesia uh, on State University, uh, is organization uh, consisting of 92 uh, universities, state on our public universities, that are part of 4,500 universities in Indonesia. These 92 uh, state-owned university are the role model of university. <clears throat> uh, in this case, uh, Kraisu, Council of Rector, is very happy uh, to the activities initiated and organized by U.S. Embassy, especially Bu Atasa, Bu Professor Poppy because it has a many benefit, beneficial for us, for our students and for uh, our staff. Yeah? Uh, ladies and gentlemen and uh, distinguished uh, audience, the academic staff or lecturer who graduated uh, from USA University, uh, commonly in Indonesia, especially in our university, uh, we call it as the first generation academic staff because they took the study at around in uh, 1970 to 1980. And then uh, most of them have retired already. Uh, now the generation has changed. We need to rejuvenate academic staff especially come from uh, USA universities. We know that US universities are the best one in the world. Uh, uh, like in ITS, Institute of Technology 10 November in Surabaya, Indonesia, last year, we sent nine young academic staff to USA universities. This is a four PhD program. This is a good news. After decades, uh, we have no more academic staff uh, graduated from USA University. So we appreciate uh, US Embassy, they're very active to facilitate universities to tight collaborations uh, between Indonesia and US uh, University. This webinar, especially for uh, postdoctoral fellowship uh, in US, of course, uh, would help us to realize our program to increase the collaboration with U.S. universities. So uh, again, on behalf of uh, uh, Kraisu, Council of Rector uh, of Indonesia University, uh, we appreciate and we would uh, support this event and actively involve the activity, including sending students and academic staff. So thank you very much uh, for this uh, organized and initiate and also the invitation to the crisis, uh, the Council of Rector of Indonesia University. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Asari, for the support. So uh, all the opening remarks uh, delivered by our partner would really enhance the collaboration between the US and Indonesia. Now we are going to invite uh, uh, the, the speaker from Harvard uh, Medical School, Boston Children University. Uh, uh, Boston Children Hospital, uh, Dr. Lu An, to uh, present how to get the fellowship uh, in the US. Please welcome, Dr. Lu. You are muted.
Dr. Lu N, are you on? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you? Okay, sorry yes. about that. I was just going to say, what, I'm happy to share my slides when I'm done. Okay. And that one of the things I was asked to address was the state of research in the Boston area since COVID. And it's not in my slides because we're back up to 100% capacity. For the first three or four months of the pandemic, we were limited. We were having trouble getting visas. We were having trouble getting people onboarded. But now we're back up to full steam. The visa offices are working. Everything's fine. Um, so I titled my, toast, my talk to be or not to be a postdoc. Um, I am the program manager in the Office of Fellowship Training at Boston Children's Hospital. Children's is one of the hospital teaching affiliates, affiliates of Harvard Medical School. Um, just to give you some demographics on our fellows, we have about 750 research fellows at Boston Children's Hospital and about 250 clinical fellows. And depending on the year, we are 65 to 75% international. So we have a lot of fellows from around the world. All right, so first of all, what is a postdoc or research fellow? Believe it or not, there is no generally accepted definition in the United States. Um, at the Harvard institutions, we define a postdoc or research fellow as being synonymous. There, is, there are advanced degree holders who performs novel and innovative research under the direction of a faculty member or a principal investigator. Uh, it's an opportunity for doctor level researchers to require additional training and or domain knowledge to come home with new techniques or to delve into a new area. Why would you do a postdoctoral fellowship? First and foremost, if you want an academic career in the United States, Europe, Australia, Canada, you have to do a postdoctoral fellowship. Um, people do not become faculty without postdoctoral fellowships. If you feel you want to deepen your domain knowledge, it might be a reason to do a fellowship. If you want to learn new cutting edge skills or techniques, another good reason to do a fellowship. I think one of the reasons that people tend to underestimate is if you want to pivot into a new area. So I'm an immunologist by training. Um, I did, I'm an HIV animal modeler by training, but I wanted to pivot into neuroimmunology. So I did my first postdoctoral fellowship in AIDS-induced encephalitis. It got me into the brain. It got me into a whole new area that I didn't want to go back to school and get another PhD, but I wanted to gain expertise in the central nervous system. And another reason to get a postdoctoral fellowship is if you want to further your training in another country. Like I said, 65 to 75 percent of our fellows are on visas. They are international scholars. Um, the Boston area welcomes them. Why would you do a postdoctoral fellowship in Boston? Because there's tons of you here <laughs> and it's a great place to do science. But Boston is one of the, the central locations of um, the epicenters of higher education and biotechnology in the United States. Between the Harvard Medical School institutions, Boston University, Tufts, um, Northeastern UMass Medical School, MIT and the Broad, there are nine to 10,000 fellows in the Boston area alone. It's a highly collaborative environment. There's tons of opportunity here. What do you need to be a postdoc or to get a postdoctoral position? First and foremost, you need an advanced degree. You have to have a PhD, an MD, an MD, PhD, or one of the other equivalents of these degrees. You need to be self-motivated and have the drive, desire, and the ability to work independently. You need to be a critical thinker. Um, your problem solving skills are the main reasons why we hire postdoctoral fellows. You need to be creative at your problem solving skills. You need to be able to think outside the box, right? A lot of what is done at the institutions that we're talking about and at the post postdoc level are unsolved problems, unanswered questions. You need to have a creative approach at solving them. You need to be flexible and you need to be resilient. Um, you need to be flexible, especially if you're going to live abroad. You have to be accepting of new cultures, able to share and be supportive of everybody around you, and you need to be resilient. Academic research, especially at you know places at the caliber of Harvard or of MIT, you're going to have a lot of failure. Experiments don't work 90% of the time because you're doing things that have never been done before. You're going to have to be resilient. You're going to be living here with no support. 
You'll, you'll make friends eventually, but you'll have no family. You'll have no support structures. And because of some people's managerial styles, and we're going to talk about how to pick your PI later, um, you may have to have a very thick skin. Some people manage by being overly critical, and you're going to need to have that be a driver for you, not a distinguisher, not a, a downplay. Um, you're going to need a certain domain knowledge, depending PIs hire fellows for different reasons. Sometimes they want a very deep domain knowledge. Sometimes they're hiring you for your cutting edge skills or techniques, not necessarily your area of expertise. Um, you would need to have at least one publication in a peer reviewed journal, usually, um, primarily in English. Um, and the ability to give good scientific presentations. Part of all of our postdoctoral interviews include you presenting your doctoral level research to people in your new lab. What should you look for in your PI and lab? If I were to ask you all this, what your first consideration would be, you would all tell me it's science. Um, science is important, but I do not believe it is the most important. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The science needs to be interesting. It needs to be novel. Is it transferable to your career goals? Um, I have, so I told you I'm an immunologist. I had many classmates that wanted to go back to their own country. And to do that, they had to stay in microbiology or infectious diseases because there was no jobs for basic immunology or B cell class switching in their countries. So you need to keep that in mind when you're picking your fellowship. Does the lab publish in good journals? Um, do all the members of the lab publish, or is it just a select few? Are there 20 people in the lab, but the same three postdocs are first author on every paper? You, you want to make sure that it's an equally distributed, everybody's got an interesting project. Most PhDs will tell you this is the most important thing, but I don't think it is. Many of us find many areas of science to be interesting and could find a different area of science to be interesting. Fit. I think is gonna be the number one reason why you succeed and thrive as a postdoc. Because if you don't fit in or you don't get the mentoring you need, it's a deal breaker, no matter how interesting the science is. So some things you need to know about your PI before you accept the position. You need to know, are they a good mentor? You can find this out by asking questions. Where are their former trainees? If they don't know, don't go there. If they don't know where their trainees ended up, they are not a good mentor. That's a clear indicator. Are they accessible to meet with their trainees or are they so busy and have so many clinical duties that you're only gonna see them once a month or once every two months? Ask the other postdocs how they handle conflict. Do they avoid it or do they manage it and have everybody work together and solve the problems? Do they support their trainees in their career goals? Ask the other fellows, what happened if a fellow decided to go to industry? Did the PI stop talking to them? Put them on a less important project? If that's true, that's not a good mentor. A mentor needs to support you in your career goals, not in creating mini-me's, okay? Um, how do they handle negative data and experimental roadblocks? One of the biggest conflicts I see with fellows is when something isn't working and the boss refuses to admit that it's not working and thinks the postdoc isn't working hard enough or the postdoc isn't being productive or we say the PI is married to the hypothesis. No matter how much the data tells them they're wrong, they refuse to admit they're wrong. In that case, everything's always going to be your fault when something doesn't work. So you want to make sure that they're good at handling those things. They can help you troubleshoot. They can help you pivot your way of thinking. What is their managerial style? Learn are they micromanagers? Are they going to tell you every detail of every experiment? Or are they just big picture thinkies that will let you do what you want? You don't always want to do exactly what you want, but you're not going to learn if you're not allowed to make your own mistakes. So a good mentor will let you do a set of experiments knowing that it may not work, but give you the ability to stretch your, your wings. Otherwise, how are you ever going to leave a lab, lead a lab or come up with creative approaches? Um, are you given opportunities to attend meetings and present your research? You need to network to get any kind of job when you get out here. You need to be the face of your research and your papers. Make sure you're able to present at meetings. Is the lab collaborative? 
collaborative. Will the other postdocs work with you? Or are they always going to be competing with you? Are you going to be competing for reagents? Are you going to be competing for projects? Does the mentor have the reputation of putting two people on the same project and whoever gets there first wins? That's not a place you want to do your fellowship. You want to be someplace where everybody is supportive and given a research project. Are there other postdocs there? Do they get along? Ask these questions. Do you, you know, do you spend time outside the lab with the other fellows in the lab? That's a good indicator that everybody gets along. And does the lab have the resources and the support staff necessary? Does your lab have the funding it needs? Do, you do they have the technical expertise, the technicians that have been in the lab for a while that can help train you in things so you don't have to learn everything from scratch? You're not reinventing the wheel. Um, there is a public database in the United States, um, NIH money, and the NIH funds 90% of the research in the United States is taxpayer money. Because of that, there is a public database where you can look up how much NIH money your potential PI has to make sure they have the funding for you to complete your fellowship. Okay. All right. What do you need to look for in the institution? This is equally important. You want to be at an institution that supports your career and professional development, that provides resources for the fellows, that extends beyond the lab and extends into the other skills you need to be successful. First thing, does it have an active postdoc office with diverse training programs? Does it have an active postdoc association? If the postdocs have an association, it's another source of career and professional development programs that you won't have to do for yourself. They'll be available to you. Is there a fellow specific orientation and onboarding process? There's nothing worse than to arrive at a new job in a new country and nobody tells you how to see your paycheck, how to pick your benefits. The insurance system in the United States is totally different than what you're used to. Someone's got to be there to explain those kind of things to you. Is there a posted policy manual? And do they have a, a policy about certain things? You, you want a clear statement of your benefits. Do you have a health insurance? Do you have dental insurance? Do you have vision insurance? In Massachusetts, you must have health insurance. So you want to make sure you have access to it. It's also a stipulation of a J-1 visa. So you want to make sure that you're getting that at a group rate. Um, you want to make sure that you get vacation, what maternity leave is like, what the parenting leave policies are like, and does the institution have a route for conflict resolution? If you get into a disagreement with your boss about authorship status, or you're not getting along with your PI or another fellow in the lab, are there resources for you to go to get the support that you need? What types of program should you be looking for? If you're Dead set on an academic career, you're going to need to know how to write grants. Make sure they have programs that teach you how to write grants that help you look for granting opportunities. At Children's, we have eight different courses that teach you how to write grants. One of them, we hire a professional grant writer to teach you how to write a grant, proofread your grant, and give you peer editing opportunities. I offer one-on-one -on -one grant searching opportunities for all of my fellows. I will sit down and use the subscription-based grant search engines that we have to help you come up with a series of wording that you can run once a month to see if there's any grants in your area. Because what's going to determine whether you get an academic position is going to be papers and grants. The fellows that are leaving children's and getting academic professorships have already been funded. In the United States, if you want to stay in the United States, 85% of our fellows will out, end up outside of academia because there's not a lot of academic positions. But if you want one of those positions, make sure you get funding before you're ready to leave us. Okay, You're going to need manuscript writing courses. We, have, we also hire a professional manuscript writer, a PhD in neuroscience, to teach our fellows how to write manuscripts and to proofread them for them. Um, we have a job, we have a series on how to apply for a faculty position, how to write a research statement, how to write a teaching statement, how to write a diversity statement. All of these things are now needed for your academic career search. If you're going to an institution that relies on teaching, you want to have been able to take courses in teaching or have the ability to teach while you're at your fellowship. And then you need to know how to give scientific talks, 
how to make clear slides. If it's possible, have that, you know, for the institution to have practice sessions. When my fellows get ready to look for jobs, we recruit faculty to listen to their job talks, to give them critiques, to listen to their chalk talks. For all careers, any career in science, whether you stay in academics or not, you're going to need some professional development. You're going to need leadership courses, how to lead your lab, how to manage people. Do you know how to give feedback? Do you know how to have a productive conversation? Do you know how to have an effective negotiation? How do you deal with an abrasive personality if there's somebody in your group that's having trouble getting along with other people? CV and resume writing, we have, you know, you want to have courses, but you also want to have somebody who can look it over and help you get to get, get it together. Um, our office also offers career coaching, which my fellows find really useful if they're looking for a plan B, if they're not sure they want to be an academic scientist to try to investigate what else is out there that might fit their career goals. Um, and then if you're going to leave academics or you want to work on very translational research that you want to see it have an effect on patients before 20 years from now, right? You're going to need to learn about the business of science, how you commercialize science. Um, I, I, you know, I always look for programs that have courses or panel discussions on careers outside of academia so that you know the full gamut of what's available to you when you leave. Um, also, as a stipulation of J-1 visas, the institutions are supposed to offer some type of English as a second language course. Make sure it's available to you at all levels. We have courses in everything from beginners to advanced ac accent reduction courses to support our, our visa holders. All right, and then where to look for postdoc positions in the United States. Um, unfortunately, the most common way is still cold, cold emailing a lab of interest. Look on PubMed, look at investigators who you're interested in and reach out to them in an email tell, telling them what about their work that caught your attention and you're interested in postdocing with them. It, you're going to get 50% of them are going to ignore you. You know, 30% of them are going to tell you they don't have money right now and maybe 15% of them will answer you but that's how you target labs. Um, many institutions in the United States don't list their postdoc positions on their career websites. So this is the way you have to go about it. Network, when you go to national and international meetings, ask around to who's looking. Um, many PIs will put their positions on Nature Careers and I link to the site for you. There are science careers. In the United States, we have something called the Higher Education Recruitment Consortium. You can use it for any area of the country. And if you put postdoc into keywords, all the postdoc positions in that city will appear. Um, institutions sometimes will have postdoctoral websites at Children's. It's hosted on my website. So if you go to the Office of Fellowship Training, there'll be open fellowship positions. There's only 20 there. Don't get discouraged. That's just the principal investigators that have asked for help recruiting. We may have way more positions that are open that may be advertised on the higher education website. So take check that out. Um, there's a National Postdoc Association in the United States, and they have a career opportunities page. I suggest you check out that. Look on LinkedIn. If you put in jobs and put in Boston with postdoc in the keywords, tons of postdocs will come up. Uh, you know, you can look in Indeed. Any journal specific to your discipline, I would look in Journal of Immunology or you know, AIDS Research and Opportunistic Infections. If you're in chemistry, look in the Journal of Chemistry. Um, look at the professional organizations, the AAAS, FASAB, ASH, um, the American Ch Chemical Society, whatever is the professional organization for your, for your field. And that's all I got for slides, but I'm happy to take questions if anybody has any questions. Thank you, amazing, uh, Dr. Luan, for a very fantastic and then very inspiring presentation. So we are going to have a second speaker and then we will follow by Q&A. Uh, now we are going to invite uh, the second speaker, uh, Professor Mingyan Liu from uh, UK, Michigan. Okay, Hi, can you hear me? All right. Bianca.
Okay, sorry. Uh, please, uh, Professor Liu, you may no uh, start your presentation. Hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be here um, to say a few words about my institution, uh, my own experience. My name is Minyan Liu. Um, I hail from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. I have been a faculty here for just over 20 years. I, my own background technically, uh, so I am the chair of electrical and computer engineering, so I'm part of the uh, College of Engineering here. My own background is in sequential decision theory, game theory, incentive mechanisms. Uh, what I do usually involves large scale network systems such as communication networks. Um, I, I did not do a postdoc myself and I have not actually worked with many postdocs. So I thought what I'll do is say a few words about um, the University of Michigan in general, the ECE department here in particular, um, give you a sense of the type of research areas we cover. Then I will also um, touch upon um, here how, how you would go about looking for postdoc position and the type of things that uh, you should watch out for. And I think um, some of the, uh, the points I raised uh, uh, will be essentially a repetition of uh, what the previous speaker mentioned, but uh, from a different uh, discipline. So for those of you who don't know, uh, our university campus is located in the, in the town, the city of Ann Arbor. Uh, we are just over 200 years old. Uh, we are a top public university with uh, about 50,000 students uh, across a number of campuses. Our overall research expenditure is ranked number two in the nation, uh, just behind Johns Hopkins and number one in public institution. University of Ann Arbor is a very large uh, university that has 19 schools and colleges uh, close to 300 degree programs. I list some of the, uh, the examples here. Um, we pride ourselves in a, a large number of highly ranked programs. Um, and overall, um, uh, we enjoy a very good reputation. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is, depending on how many years you spend in postdoc, uh, we usually tell our grad students, you know, you're talking about five years of your life, postdocs, it can be anywhere between one, two, three, four years. Uh, sometimes you stay and become a research scientist. And so the quality of life in the place uh, becomes important. Um, Ann Arbor is one of, uh, I would say, the best college towns here in the United States, um, consistently ranked as um, one of the best places to be. A uh, lot of things to explore, very rich in culture uh, and very diverse in, in, um, in, in population, ethnicity, food, uh, culture, music, everything. Um, the College of Engineering here, um, we have uh, over 12,000 students uh, between undergraduate graduates. Um, it consists of 13 departments, divisions. Uh, electrical computer engineering is one of them. Um, over 85,000 living alumni and our annual research expenditure is around 320 million. Okay, uh, now about ECE. I don't know uh, the background of the attendees here. I hope some of you uh, have an engineering background. Um, the, the word cloud here was made uh, by using the keywords our faculty used to uh, summarize their expertise. Um, and as the way these are constructed, the larger the word, the more frequent that word appeared in our faculty's profile. And here, this is give, giving you a graphical sense of the types of activities research our faculty engage in. Um, system theory, device, data, control, power. Uh, but you also see a fair amount of um, biological life science related uh, activities. Um, 
This is a forum about um, getting postdoc positions. Uh, here I show um, in terms of our faculty, we have 70 tenure tenure track faculty. Um, we have uh, just over a dozen research scientists and we have a few dozen postdoc researchers. So that's a fairly large um, part of our um, faculty here in the department. And here it gives you a sense of um, the student population, we have a very large master's students cohort, as well as a very large PhD uh, student cohort. Um, our faculty uh, are very active in technology transfer. Um, they have start, uh, start uh, among our faculty, there have been over 30 startups um, since 2010. And I can tell you um, our postdoc fellows and research scientists are oftentimes very active participants in uh, these venture activities. Uh, we have highly ranked undergraduate and graduate programs. Um, let me skip over this. I just mentioned we have a 70 tenure tenure track faculty. Uh, our research expenditure is right at $50 million, the most recent fiscal year. This breakdown gives you a sense of where our research funding comes from. Um, you just heard that as faculty members, uh, one of the, uh, the I would say very important activities that we engage in is writing research grants and getting research funding to support our research activities. Um, we get a good chunk from DOD, Department of Defense. Uh, National Science Foundation supports another third of our research. Um, the part of the energy, uh, our funding from DOE has been consistently rising as uh, is our funding from NIH, that's National Institute of Health. As an engineering department, traditionally we don't get a lot of funding from NIH, uh, but we have been seeing an uptick in that. Um, a lot of um, uh, device related, so for instance, uh, single neural probe, types of um, devices, as well as um, AI, machine learning, algorithmic decision-making as applied to biological sciences, life sciences, and medical image uh, processing. Those types of research, uh, re uh, research are getting increasing uh, funding from NIH. We also get a lot of industry funding, that's the non-federal part is a, a sort of a small amount from foundation, but mostly this is from industry sources. Um, so here is a list of the types of the areas that we cover. Um, there are about 13, 14 of them, including, uh, and this is unusual among engineering departments, we also have engineering education research. So this is for people who are interested in conducting research to understand how best to provide engineering education. Uh, beyond that, of course, this is a fairly common list of subjects you will find in a typical large ECE department, and we are one of the largest in the United States. Um, it covers any, uh, all the way from applied physics at one end of the spectrum to applied mathematics at the other end of the spectrum and just about everything in between. Okay, right in the middle is computer engineering, circuits, architecture, embedded systems. On the device side, you have photonics, uh, optoelectronics, um, you have plasma science, um, quantum technology, solid state, nano, and on the um, other end, we have a lot of faculty in information sciences, networks, information theory, signal image processing, machine learning, robotics, computer vision, AI. Okay, so I am coming to the end of my uh, quick overview. How to apply for postdoc position. Um, as Dr. Posey just mentioned, for us, um, these positions are very much spread, spread around um, among individual faculty groups. And so you really do have to reach out, check out their profile. The good thing is 
everything you need to know about uh, research groups, faculty, their activities, it's all on in the public domain. You can find all of that on our website. Um, find, uh, look at what may appear to be a good match and reach out to them. Uh, many of our faculty are constantly looking for postdoc fellows. Uh, the information on, on the other hand is not in a single place because it's not organized by a central entity. I will mention that the demand for postdoc is very uneven. In our uh, experimental side of the, uh, the discipline, there tend to be more postdoc demand, more positions. On a more theoretical side, we tend to uh, work mostly with graduate PhD students, uh, but you will find postdoc positions there as well, just not in large quantity. Um, there are, do you have to get a postdoc? Not in all areas that we cover. Uh, we routinely hire faculty, um, hire candidates into tenure track faculty positions without a postdoc. However, uh, postdoc training does come with many benefits. Some you have already heard. It's a way to deepen your expertise. It's a way to transition into new exciting areas. Um, and for the audience here, if you obtained your PhD from your home country, then getting a postdoc in, in the United States is a way to get to know the educational and research system in the United States. And I will say, um, if your goal is to obtain a faculty position or even an industry research position, R&D position here in the state, getting a postdoc here is probably a necessary step. Um, what are the, some of the things you can achieve um, through a postdoc experience? I think it's a fantastic opportunity to gain research independence, to become a mature researcher. Uh, it's a way to uh, add to your research output. Um, and it's a very good way to build your research connections, build your networks, which I would say no matter what you do uh, in the next chapter of your lives uh, would be very important. Some of the things to watch out for in important considerations in looking for postdoc position, deciding whether to accept one. Um, again, some of these you have already heard. Um, I think it's very important to, to have a good clear understanding of the research project that you're stepping into. Is it really something that you're interested in doing? Uh, does it have a clear um, outline, goal? Um, understand the duration of the postdoc. How many, uh, how many years are funded? Is it renewable? Um, is additional years uh, contingent on X, Y, Z? Make sure you get a good understanding of that. I think it's also important to know the, uh, the, pro the research project that you'll be on, who are the other participants? Uh, some of our projects are very large multi-institutional projects and there are advantages to be part of such a project because it allows you to, um, to connect with researchers from other institutions. It's important to understand what the career trajectory is um, and make sure that you and your faculty mentor have a good understanding of each other's expectations. Not all postdoc positions are meant to launch you into an academic career. Um, as the previous speaker just mentioned, uh, sometimes these positions are, are specifically for a certain set of deliverables. It may not give you the, the depth or the width of um, training that you might need for your own career goal. So make sure you, um, you and your faculty mentor have good uh, understanding of mutual expectations. Uh, this again is repeating a previous point. I think it's important to know what the track record of the group is. Where um, have they ever had postdocs in the past? Where are they now? Uh, where are their students who have graduated? I think it's important to know, to find out whether there is a standard, a systematic mentoring a support system in place. I think that's very important. 
Okay, uh, here at University of Michigan, we have various mentoring systems in place, including uh, official orientation, onboarding sessions, various workshops run by our Rackham Graduate School, um, specifically for postdoc fellows. Last but not least, find out whether the group that you're going to join combined with the research project you're gonna be part of, are there re opportunities of teaching, student advising, be it undergraduate, master or post uh, a PhD students, as well as proposal writing opportunities. Again, in our discipline, these do not necessarily come with a standard postdoc position, uh, but oftentimes they, they, uh, they are available uh, and you should ask uh, the faculty mentor. And a lot of them are open to, um, to, to, uh, to discussing uh, uh, such opportunities with you, uh, but it's important to make your plans and aspirations known to them. So with that, I will stop here. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. For the presentation, Professor Ryu. Now we have uh, one question uh, from uh, Lenny, a School of Electrical Engineering uh, in Bandung, West Java, Indonesia, from ITB. I would like to ask about the duration of postdoc program. Uh, what is the minim, minimum duration usually offered by the university or by the institution? And also, uh, is there any specific time to apply for the beginning of or in the middle of the year? Okay, maybe you uh, you may uh, answer by Dr. Luen and Professor Minyan. Yeah, I think, yeah, you, you still mute, mute. There is no voice. Yeah. Oh, no voice, no sound. How about now? Yeah, okay. I was gonna say at Children's, it depends on the discipline. Many of our engineering or bioinformatics postdocs will stay a year, maybe two. But in the biological sciences, four to five years before you get enough publications or any grant to move on. Um, as time, we onboard postdocs every single week. There is no particular hiring time. It's not like you have to come in July or you have to come in December. Um, we onboard every single week. So it's just a matter of when the lab has money and when they hire. Um, at Children's, a lot of labs will only commit to the first year. They'll say renewal is dependent on funding, progress, and fit. That's not uncommon to see in your offer letter. Okay, thank you. Professor Lee? Yeah, so duration of a postdoc for us, one to two years is very typical. I would say typically you will get at least a minimum one year. Um, it's very unusual to have a postdoc position that's less than a year. Um, one year, sometimes we'll say it's renewable for a second year, and maybe the funding is available. The PI may not have made up their mind. So one to two years is common. Uh, for us in, in our discipline, in ECE, uh, going beyond three years is uncommon. Uh, so for us, um, in your, in your, you know, if you are going to go beyond third year, then the question becomes um, either we should promote you to research scientists or it's time for you to go. So for us, it's one to three years, I would say one to two is more common. Uh, similar um, to uh, the, the children's hospital, there's no fixed start date. Again, it's the same thing for us. When the position starts, it's entirely a matter of when the money becomes available. Every PI has project starts at different times. Um, so it's all, uh, it, this is all case by case. There's, it's unlike um, 
you know, graduate students, we start them at a fixed time of the year. Okay, thank you. Uh, it is very interesting, uh, Dr. Uh, Lu and mentioned that at Harvard uh, Medical School, uh, Boston Children Hospital, you have nearly 700 uh, uh, postdoc fellows. Uh, and also from uh, University of uh, Michigan at Ann Arbor. Do you acknowledge a uh, different educational background uh, to be admitted in the program? As you mentioned that there is many hybrid research collaboration between uh, your uh, institution, uh, how uh, in engineering side and also how uh, at your institution at Harvard Medical School, particularly at uh, Boston Children Hospital. Yeah. So, I mean, Children's isn't a degree granting institution. So if we have any PhDs, gra graduate students in our labs, they're Harvard graduate students mm -hmm. or graduate students from, from universities that, abroad that we have um, agreements with. Um, in terms of fellows, it can be any kind of advanced degree. We have a lot of foreign trained MDs that do research fellows and fellowships in our labs because they can't practice here. And we have many PhDs, we have vets, we have vet PhDs, we have psychology PhDs, we have social work PhDs, we have, we even have lawyers that do health policy fellowships at Children's. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the advanced degree doesn't matter so much, it's just you have to have an advanced degree. Okay, very interesting. So uh, is this not only STEM background, but also social science and also humanities, the possibility for engaging or uh, acknowledge in the postdoctoral program? Except so at Children's, we don't have any of the humanities or social science postdocs, but at Harvard and the Cambridge campus, so Harvard, the graduate school, they do. So in Cambridge, there are social sciences, there are, um, there's art, there's history, postdoctoral programs, but children's is all biomedical science, engineering, and bioinformatics. That, that's all we have. Okay. Uh, and then how about uh, at the University of uh, Michigan Ann Arbor, Professor Liu? So we are postdocs from everywhere. Uh, we certainly have many postdocs who obtain their PhD degrees from countries other than the United States. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, they, don't, they, they don't have to have a PhD degree from, from the US, but uh, by definition, they have a PhD degree from somewhere. Um, in terms of discipline, uh, most of our postdocs hold advanced degree, PhD degree in mathematical sciences, computational sciences, um, physics, um, any number of engineering disciplines. Okay. So I think uh, the explanation from Professor Liu uh, could answer some question has been uh, mentioned in the chat room. Uh, we also would like to uh, uh, ask about, uh, it is very interesting, uh, Dr. Lu N mentioned that it is very rare the university will advertise or inform the possibility for applying the uh, postdoctoral fellowship uh, openly. Sometimes we get from the network, personal network and et cetera. And then how uh, we could uh, get uh, proper information in a fastest way and also in a proper way. Maybe you, you have already mentioned the tip and tricks, how to get this uh, opportunity. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Lu An would uh, elaborate more uh, to, yeah. Yeah, to, to give more information uh, to the audience. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so it's not that they don't advertise, it's that they don't advertise on the human resources site. So a lot of hospitals and universities have a place where you go, it says careers and all staff positions will be listed there, but trainee positions won't. Um, they will advertise in journals, in scientific journals. They will advertise on the higher education site. They will advertise on LinkedIn. But still, the most common way to get a fellowship is just to send an email to a faculty member whose work you're interested in. And I think a little known fact these days is if you go on PubMed and find any faculty member you're interested in, if you open up the journal and go to the, the um, 
you know, the, the communication author, they will give you that person's email. And, and so you can get their email address and just email them directly. Um, okay. Thank you so much, yeah. Professor Liu, would you add more information? Um, so unfortunately, I don't have a, uh, I don't have better advice. Uh, so for us uh, faculty who have postdoc uh, positions open, they, as we already mentioned, they tend to broadcast this among their 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 network. Uh, they will tell this to their acquaintances and so on. We don't have a public bulletin for these posting. And unlike other HR positions where uh, the posting is, is properly regulated, you know, once you post, you, it has to stay on the post for at least a certain number of weeks before you start interviewing people and so on. Uh, these postdoc positions, they, they come and go. They're almost entirely at the discretion of the PI. So it is very hard to regulate. Um, it and I will say I have certainly known faculty who they they have a position they they looked at a number of resumes and they decided to use the money differently and so there's also you know fluidity to this and I have had faculty who went the other way around they they tried to rest students didn't work out they said forget it i'm going to now get a postdoc um so it, it is it can be um it can be a black box um but the the fact that you know we have sebastian is here he is um i'm sure he has experience to share how he landed his postdoc position with us um it it does, I would say, takes persistence, takes time, do your homework, find out what projects are active, take a look at the papers, uh, different research groups are publishing, maybe getting to get in touch with some of their grad students. I have, like I said, I haven't worked with too many postdocs, but some of my grad students joined my group because of other grad students I had. Um, you know, so sorry, I couldn't be more more helpful. So can I, I just want to address the people keep asking about getting a postdoctoral scholarship. Most of our fellows, when they come, do not come with their own money. What, that, what I mean by that is the principal investigator is looking for a fellow. They have NIH money to pay that fellow and they bring the fellow into their lab. Um, you can then write grants once you're with us um, and you can get the grant to extend your fellowship or to extend your project, but we don't expect the fellows to necessarily already have funding when they come. The lab won't hire somebody until they have money to pay them for at least a year. That is what we require. Once you're there, they should support you in writing your own fellowships and getting your own funding, but you don't have to have money before you apply. Okay. Very interesting. So this is kind of opportunity for all the participants who plan to apply for postdoctoral fellowship. Uh, time is uh, approaching us and then a lot of questions, I believe, that delivered by the participant. We would like to inform based on the data who register uh, to this webinar is nearly 800 participants. And then they are watching at uh, Facebook Live uh, at the moment. And then the link of the Facebook Live can be accessed anytime. And then they come from uh, a professor in the university, and then also lecturer, and also researcher at the research institution, and also uh, uh, a doctoral uh, student at the uh, university in Indonesia. So we have 118 public university in Indonesia. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Luan uh, from Harvard uh, Medical School, Boston Children's Hospital, and Professor uh, Ming Yan Liu. So we hopefully we could uh, engage in building the potential uh, research collaboration 
in the future, as mentioned by our president director from Indonesia Endowment Fund for Education, uh, LPDP, the Ministry of Finance, Republic of Indonesia. So hopefully we could uh, discuss in more depth how to establish uh, potential uh, postdoctoral fellowship between the US and Indonesia in our university. So more uh, American researcher could also do in Indonesia and also more Indonesian researcher could also uh, engage in your program. Thank you so much uh, for your presence. And then we are looking forward for having more collaborative uh, project. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Now we would like to invite uh, the second uh, presenter uh, of our uh, 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 fellow, uh, postdoctoral fellow uh, from Harvard uh, Medical uh, School at Boston uh, Children's Hospital. So we will uh, invite Dr. Novalia uh, Pisesa. Please uh, welcome. You may present in Bahasa Indonesia or mixed in English. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Give me one second. Yeah, by you. Yeah, can you share the screen? Yeah, yeah, give me one second. Okay. I think this looks good. Yeah. Okay, I think this is fine, yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, halo, selamat pagi, selamat malam uh, semuanya. Uh, saya Nova, saya sekarang uh, postdoc di um, di US, tepatnya di Harvard uh, Society of Fellows dan di Boston General Hospital, Harvard Medical School area dan di MIT di sini. Um, so hari ini saya karena sudah dijelaskan oleh Dr. Luan dan juga Profesor Ming, Profesor Ming before uh, bahwa uh, bagaimana untuk mendapatkan uh, posisi postdoc di di US. Hari ini saya akan menceritakan uh, my journey uh, dari lulus sekolah sampai sekarang bisa mendapatkan posisi ini. Jadi ini uh, n equal to one karena ini personal experience ya. Yeah. But I think I hope that this can give you guys an idea about what are uh, the process in order to build in your uh, CV so that like you can be a very strong candidates of Uh, for postdoc position. Oke, okay. so ini uh, saya dari S1, uh, dari S1 sudah di US, jadi uh, mendapatkan Bachelor of Science di Bioengineering, kemudian karena punya research experience bisa langsung S3, kalau di sini di US itu nggak perlu uh, S2 dulu kalau udah punya research experience, jadi saya selesaikan PhD di Biology Blending, kemudian sekarang sedang melakukan postdoctoral activities, um, dan juga nanti akan saya touch sedikit mengenai beberapa research project yang saya kerjakan. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, saya lahir di Singosari, jadi anak anak Malang, uh, dekat Malang. Uh, kemudian sekolah di sana juga uh, sampai lulus SMA. Kemudian barusan setelah itu uh, ke City uh, County College sebenarnya mulai di City College San Francisco uh, dan kemudian menyelesaikan degree S1-nya di Berkeley, kemudian PhD di Biological Engineering dan ini yang saya kerjakan sekarang sebagai uh, posisi saya di di sini. Uh, sedikit mengenai uh, pengalaman saya kayak mengapa memilih di kota San Francisco uh, itu karena memang lebih murah waktu itu dan uh, pembelajarannya juga enak untuk uh, dari Indonesia ke sana karena bahasa Inggris saya waktu itu juga kurang bagus jadi uh, jadi ya uh, bisa dilan lebih lancar gitu kemudian ceritanya saya dua, dua tahun di sana di City College of San Francisco kemudian uh, dua setengah tahun di Berkeley untuk menyelesaikan Bachelor of Science saya jadi uh, bukannya karena saya tahu dari dulu dari uh, saya nggak tahu juga waktu masih di City College uh, saya ingin do postdoc atau apa itu saya sebenarnya nggak tahu cuman ya yeah, um, I try to work hard and try uh, to like uh, do a lot of different things that help will enrich my experience belajar di Amerika. Uh, jadi get the most out of the time here. Dan sebenarnya saya juga nggak tadi ada yang tanya tentang fellowship karena kan memang kalau dari Indonesia kita nggak nggak uh, the funding is very difficult. Jadi sebenarnya saya juga nggak bukan dari keluarga yang punya uh, dan orang tua saya juga nggak juga tidak terlalu pendidikannya nggak tinggi belum nggak lulus SMA juga segala macam tapi uh, makanya waktu saya kesini juga perlu beasiswa jadi untungnya kayak yang diceritakan oleh Lu, uh, Luan uh, ya setiap 
waktu saya masih uh, kuliah juga dari dulu selalu mencari kayak oh ya bisa nggak saya selain belajar aja kan penting banget jadi ini bisa dilihat bahwa waktu kita masih S1 itu fokusnya biasanya di kelas jadi berusaha supaya kelasnya bagus nilainya bagus dan itu yang saya kerjakan supaya bisa transfer ke sekolah yang bagus juga tapi nggak cuma kelas aja biasanya para universitas ini juga melihat perlunya kamu uh, jadi well rounded jadi punya saya teaching juga supaya complement with uh, my income waktu itu karena dibayar bisa bisa bekerja sebagai tutor dan dibayar di city college waktu itu uh, kemudian scholarshipnya ya apply semuanya yang yang international student bisa apply dan lumayan cukup untuk membiayai sekolahnya dan penting sekali kayak melakukan community outreach dan juga leadership juga untuk menunjukkan bahwa kita involved dengan uh, the surrounding and so on. jadi sih cuman saya menunjukkan uh, contoh-contoh aja kayak gimana kita bisa hit the mark uh, untuk uh, ke, ke step selanjutnya nah setelah selesai dari city group city college san francisco dan ke berkeley jadi kayak karena berkeley itu jauh lebih besar dari city college san francisco jadi lebih banyak yang bisa dikerjakan jadi tetap aja sebagai s satu student, jadi semuanya ini kita build uh, CV-nya itu memang dari dari awal kalau bisa sampai seterusnya supaya we make a strong candidate of being a postdoc. Um, yang pertama ya sekali lagi nilainya harus bagus sebagai mahasiswa S1, kemudian uh, uh, dan kemudian risetnya um, waktu itu saya melakukan riset uh, selama dua tahun di Berkeley karena di City College nggak ada riset topiknya waktu masa regeneration of aging kemudian waktu satu summer saya spend di uh, Nanjang Technological University kerjain riset yang beda banget jadi sebagai kalau di S1 itu risetnya bisa macam-macam nggak harus semuanya sama dan ini nggak harus riset yang akan kamu kerjakan waktu S3 atau postdoc jadi nggak related juga nggak apa-apa tetap belajar aja yang banyak sekali lagi ada saya I do teaching, I do community outreach, uh, beasiswanya juga dari dari uh, Berkeley semua, uh, dan juga berbagai uh, private foundation yang lainnya. Dan sekali lagi, saya untungnya dapat full ride scholarship di sana. Jadi nggak usah bayar sama sekali, dan juga dikasih uh, stipend untuk tinggal, segala macam. Dan saya juga dia dikasih kesempatan untuk me- mengambil beberapa kelas di di Jerman dan di Jepang waktu itu untuk melalui Berkeley beasiswanya juga. Jadi kayak bisa dilihat bahwa you know kayak saya biasanya kayak oh ya yeah, you know this is different boxes that kita harus mengisi supaya menjadi kandidat yang kandidat yang kompetitif dan bisa dilihat bahwa setiap kali kamu punya scholarship atau award itu Uh, uh, you know like how people said kayak money begets money. Jadi kalau punya duit jadi lebih banyak duitnya. Jadi kalau misalnya beasiswa juga gitu. Uh, kalau misalnya kamu dapat beasiswa, diterusin aja biasanya bakal lebih banyak beasiswa yang akan datang. Jadi selalu berusaha seperti itu. Kemudian setelah selesai karena saya bilang saya udah punya riset experience selama 2 tahun di Berkeley. Jadi begitu begitu lulus bisa langsung apply ke MIT uh, dan ini risetnya uh, kemudian ya great kalau sekarang course itu nggak terlalu matter sebagai mahasiswa tiga karena fokusnya lebih ke benar-benar riset dan yang saya sangat senang uh, saya kerjakan riset saya di Whitehead Institute Massachusetts Institute Technology and Boston Children Hospital like Berkeley dengan Harvard Medical School karena saya punya dua co advisors waktu itu dan thesisnya itu engineer red blood cells and their application dan uh, bisa dilihat juga bahwa walau karena kan banyak berbagai aspek ya untuk mem- buat seorang researcher itu uh, really, really good. Jadi nggak hanya projectnya aja, tapi apakah bisa juga bekerja dengan online. Jadi uh, kolaborasi dengan postdoc dan undergraduate student in the lab, but juga uh, mentorin. Jadi kayak mentor undergraduate researcher. Jadi uh, orang-orang yang lebih muda yang kita bisa bantu ajarin dan untuk uh, bantu riset kita juga. Jadi Waktu itu setelah saya waktu saya by the time I graduated saya punya 14 paper di mana tiga sebagai first author dan satu review kemudian conference presentations juga berkali-kali seperti yang dibilang bahwa kita harus bisa tahu gimana mempresentasikan proyek yang kita kerjakan dan saya juga yang paling exciting actually kayak pekerjaan saya juga jadi dua paten yang sudah di license ke company yang di co-founded oleh co-advisor saya namanya Rubius Therapeutics yang di base-base di Cambridge dan di mana saya ada kesempatan juga jadi banyak banget yang bisa dikerjakan sebagai mahasiswa S3 uh, sebagai consultant di company itu apalagi di daerah sini banyak banget biotechnya dan sekali lagi kayak banyak hal sih kita bisa do teaching because that's one of the requirements sometimes kemudian uh, kelas-kelas yang kita ambil 
Uh, dan juga sekali lagi kayak ini biar siswanya penuh jadi kayak uh, dari MIT dan dari berbagai uh, resources juga jadi kayak ya yeah, I think there are a lot of opportunity there as far as you working really hard and like keep looking for it um, dan sekali lagi juga saya masih melakukan community outreach and leadership juga uh, untuk really really complement all of the trainings that I'm doing uh, at MIT jadi uh, setelah saya lulus dari MIT saya ada uh, sebenarnya saya juga apply untuk fellowshipnya itu saat saya masih S3. Jadi saya uh, enggak seperti yang dibilang oleh Luan atau uh, Luan waktu itu uh, bahwa biasanya kan bisa apply aja terus uh, Uh, profesornya akan bayar. Waktu ini saya ada beberapa fellowship sebenarnya, termasuk yang saya punya ini namanya um, The Junior Fellowship at the Harvard Society of Fellow. Ini ada linknya kalau bisa mau lihat full informasinya lagi lebih banyak. Dan ini itu early stage, jadi saya harus apply saat saya masih PhD student, uh, supaya mulainya itu langsung setelah right after saya selesai PhD saya. Jadi waktu itu pada saya tahun menyelesaikan tahun kelima, itu saya dinominasikan oleh PhD advisor saya untuk uh, school, uh, fellowship ini. Dan ini sebenarnya untuk any discipline, jadi nggak masalah uh, kamu backgroundnya apa, kalau saya biological engineering, tapi banyak teman-teman saya juga yang di program ini yang um, yang uh, juga di social science and humanity. Jadi, so please check out this fellowship. Uh, appointment-nya yang di sini itu tiga tahun, jadi itu fully funded dengan health insurance segala macam, competitive funding, uh, dan ini karena tidak di appointment, jadi ya tiga tahun kamu bisa di sini. Um, dan ini agak agak switch around ya, dari bandingkan yang banyak fellowship-fellowship yang lain, karena di sini itu kita dapat fellowship-nya dulu, baru approach Profesor di Harvard mau kerja sama siapa dan kita juga punya kayak lebih flexibility karena punya kalau punya fellowship itu ada flexibilitinya jadi kan uh, kamu bisa mengerjakan apa yang kamu mau of course dengan agreement dengan profesor tapi kalau biasanya kalau kamu dibayar oleh profesor dari grant mereka itu kamu harus kerjakan uh, project yang profesornya mau gitu jadi ada sedikit perbedaan kalau pembawa uh, funding sendiri ke to the table gitu dan Uh, saya senang banget dengan uh, fellowship ini karena saya dapat interaksi dengan beyond just other biomedical scientists. Jadi kayak ketemu social scientists and humanities juga dan bisa belajar banyak di berbagai institusi di daerah Boston. Juga setiap minggu, uh, setiap hari man, uh, Senin, itu kita ada dinner dengan para profesor-profesor di Harvard. Ini saya dengan Wally Gilbert yang Nobel Prize winner among other things. Tapi juga ada kayak other Nobel Prize winner like Amartya Sen is part of it, among other things. So it's very, very nice. Kayak, there are a lot of different things that come with this fellowship. Oops. Ya, jadi uh, apa yang saya kerjakan sebagai junior fellow di Harvard, ya, yeah, research, of course. Kayak, dan saya belajar di berbagai lab yang berbeda-beda, belajar different things. Saya ya, publish papers, a lot of the master's authors so far, uh, then more will be coming. Uh, kemudian uh, saya juga train beberapa master student, karena sekarang udah punya PhD, jadi uh, ngajarnya master student, uh, nggak undergrad lagi, dan dua technician. Uh, kemudian saya juga ada dua paten yang sudah di-submit, dan ini currently di-license ke Cerberus Therapeutic, uh, which is um, which is the company that I actually co-founded recently uh, di Cambridge juga. Jadi saya also serve as consultant for different things in Indonesia actually, uh, teaching as well, uh, and there are other programs that I'm part of that's pretty fun to learn a lot of different things. And finally, uh, berdasarkan dibilang oleh uh, para speaker sebelumnya, uh, selain riset, kita juga harus punya funding sendiri. Jadi kayak saya juga apply funding uh, di postdoc level ini untuk membiayai Uh, beberapa proyek yang saya inisiasikan sendiri. Ya, yeah. uh, terus ya yeah, ini juga uh, beberapa scholarship dan awards yang kita bisa dapat, yang saya dapat juga di stage postdoc ini selain the uh, the society of fellow give me funding there are a lot of other stuff that I also keep looking into. So yeah, so keep uh, hustling, uh, like keep looking for opportunities and work hard and For community outreach, I also try to do a couple things uh, di Boston General Hospital, but juga uh, I, I really like to give a lot of talks like this, uh, supaya kalau misalnya ada yang bisa saya, uh, informasi yang bisa saya bantu atau saya share, I'll be so happy to share that and encourage more uh, Indonesians like you guys, uh, a, lot, a lot of you guys here to like come here and um, be a postdoc or do a S3, the STEM fields, and so on, and but then build Indonesia together, that would be fun. Um, yeah, so sedikit mengenai research interest saya, um, 
saya banyak kerjakan project-project dari protein engineering, single cell genomics, and cellular engineering. Jadi uh, saya banyak kerjakan di uh, lebih ke vaksin dan treatment buat autoimmunity, drug delivery. Jadi berbagai macam juga. Jadi it's pretty fun kayak playing around with uh, a lot of different technology and like essentially some things that we can use to uh, enhance the capacity untuk our immune system untuk fight pathogen or cure cancer or something like that. Jadi uh, saya nggak mau go toward into details because I want to like you know give more time for uh, questions and answer session. Ya kalau misalnya mau melihat kerjaan saya apa aja ya seperti yang dibilang oleh Luan earlier uh, ke PubMed aja terus uh, uh, type in my name, my last name Pisesa or like my full name Novalia Pisesa jadi bisa dilihat kerjaan saya apa aja. Uh, jadi kalau bisa in, uh, mungkin juga kayak saya senang banget dengar kalau LPDP sekarang ada possibility untuk uh, share lebih banyak funding untuk mengirim student ke sini. Be really nice that I would like to have some Indonesian student joining my team because so far uh, a lot of my students are from Europe and a lot of like China and different places. But I think it'd be really nice to get Indonesian students uh, working with me. Uh, yeah, maybe hopefully we can also write some grants together and yeah, a lot of things to do. Uh, anyway, so I think one thing that is really exciting to me, last but not least, is that like there are a lot of things you can do as a as a postdoc, dan di sini seperti enggak uh, mungkin juga uh, in particular untuk uh, untuk biotech itu Cambridge Boston area adalah the place I think it's one of the place to be karena um, ka, um, ada movie-nya sih sebenarnya jadi bisa uh, nonton aja from controversy to care gimana Cambridge itu bisa menjadi uh, biotech hub di dunia uh, padahal uh, 20-30 tahun yang lalu itu uh, kosong kayak gini gitu jadi kayak gimana bisa benar-benar biotech itu benar-benar booming accordingly Jadi uh, yeah, it's a great place to do science, to do biomedical science, at least in my personal experience. Uh, so yeah, mudah-mudahan lebih banyak uh, para mahasiswa dan scholar-scholar dari Indonesia yang bisa ke sini. Ya, terima kasih. Terus uh, kalau ada pertanyaan, silakan email saya atau um, di Instagram juga bisa, juga bisa sih. <laughs> ya, yeah. oke. Okay. Thank you. Terima kasih. Ini Mbak Nova uh, luar biasa. Bianca. Sosok yang sangat membanggakan, eh, Mbak Nova ini sudah diekspos oleh Kompas. Sebagai yeah. sosok WNI peneliti di Amerika Serikat, temukan vaksin COVID-19 yang mudah diproduksi. Silahkan di searching, di googling, ini kesempatan luar biasa. Mbak Nova sudah eh, membuka Uh, juga dirinya bisa langsung dikontak langsung, uh, emailnya sudah disampaikan. Terima kasih. Uh, selanjutnya kita akan mengundang sebelum uh, sesi Q&A uh, salah satu uh, postdoctoral fellows yang juga mendapatkan kesempatan untuk uh, meneruskan ya risetnya Dr. Sebastian uh, Nugroho. Silahkan. Ya, nama saya Sebastian Nugroho. Saya postdoctoral research uh, at Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science University of Michigan. So here I will be sharing a little bit about my PhD and postdoctoral life. And maybe if I have time, I will tell a little bit about what's the research that I'm doing here. So a little bit about me. Um, Lahir di Jogja, tahun 90. Um, Saya kuliah, jadi dari kecil tinggal di Jogja, lalu kuliah S1, S2 di ITB, lulus tahun 2014. Saya sempat mengajar di Universitas Negeri Jakarta selama 10 tahun, setelah lulus S2, lalu saya ke Jakarta untuk mendapatkan pengalaman industri selama satu setengah tahun, sampai 2017, saya memulai studi doktoral di University of Texas, San Antonio. Saya lulus tahun 2021, bulan Mei, sampai sekarang saya bekerja sebagai postdoctoral research at University of Michigan. So, mungkin sharing sedikit tentang bagaimana cara apply into PSC program. So, the first thing is we need to submit the application to the graduate school, so they have very specific form usually that you have to fill, and you also need to 
submit several documents. So this is pretty standard, a resume or CV, uh, letters of recommendations from your professor, uh, transcripts, uh, as well as statement of purpose that tells you about what's your research experience, what have you done, what is your research interest, and what you are what, uh, what you are going to do with with the research that you. So another thing is um, English language proficiency. Like I also this is the requirements from um, the campus that I get my PhD, the PSA. So the IELTS minimum minimum score is six point five and total IBT seventy nine. And some um, universities they require GRE score. Uh, some uh, do not, but in UTSA it is uh, recommended because if you have a good uh, GRE score, then they will consider you for scholarship. Um, so this is a little bit, uh, uh, sorry about UTSA. So this is the map of Texas. So we know um, Dallas, Houston, and this is San Antonio. Um, the capital of Texas is Austin. So, so UTSA is part of the University of Texas system with flagship university uh, in Austin, it established in 1969. And recently it was classified as uh, R1 uh, research universities by Carnegie classification. Um, of course, we need uh, some funding uh, for our study, right? So we know there are LPDB and US grad program, but other than that, we can always uh, find scholarships or some funding from the university itself. Usually, professors um, they're looking for that are looking for PhD students. They have some kind of uh, funding packages. Can also get some funding from local uh, company. For example, I got scholarship from Valero Energy Corporation. But for visa type, the there are two main uh, visa types. The first one is the standard F1 student visa, and the other type is a J1 student exchange visa. So usually, if you get scholarships for from government like LPDP or US Fulbright, uh, you will get a J1 visa. But if you get uh, funding from the university, usually you will get F1 visa. So since I got the funding from university, then I will share a little bit about it. So the key here is to identify potential supervisor that you want to work with. So as I said before, usually if you, they are looking for students, that they should have some kind of funding for you. So you are encouraged to send emails to these uh, potential supervisors, tell them that you are interested in working with him or with her, and tell them that you, you want to do PSD under their supervision, and you also send your CV and some of publications. So you can you can always uh, look some professor by going to their um, website. So it's profit usually they have their own personal website. If they are looking for students, they will put like announcement in the website, I'm looking for PhD students and, and so on. But it's fairly exhaustive because you need to check any websites, right? Um, another way is you can go to websites from academic or professional associations. For example, since I'm studying electrical engineering, um, my association is IEEE, it stands for Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. So for example, in CSS, stands for Control System Society, there is a state space forum. And in power and energy system, there is a power group forum. So it's a screenshot of state space forum. So if, for example, uh, say I'm looking for, I want to do a PhD in control system, then I will go to this uh, forum. And you can see there uh, on this tab, uh, there is jobs for PhD, different postdoc, faculty, researcher, and engineer. So for example, you can see that several open positions for PhD as well as faculty position and postdoc position. So this is uh, a good way to find such uh, PhD or postdoc positions. So again, um, as I explained before by Luan, that postdoc is not a degree, just another professional research job, usually lasts from one to three years. Mm -hmm. And why do we carry postdoc? Because we want to get additional training, research, and teaching experiences that we didn't get during our PhD study. And 
it, it is also helpful to prepare ourselves to become a more independent researcher. And also it allows us, or it, it gives us an opportunity to explore different fields. Um, so I believe that each postdoc has unique experience. So my responsibilities may include conducting research, assist, assisting graduate students, helping PI in teaching, and also writing experience. Uh, benefits, uh, we will not get stipend, but we will get salary. Here, uh, we will get health insurance and some other benefits. So to get postdoc position is very similar to how to get PhD uh, based on my experience. Uh, first, but the difference here is you so already have a PhD degree itself. That's why it's called postdoc. So it's like a training after PhD. So for example, um, we can go to here, I, I'm listing an example from University of California. If you go to this website, uh, they have this president's postdoctoral fellowship program. And you can go to this website and you can see what are the requirements. Another way is, again, we can, we can go back to here and you can, for example, there is a postdoc position. You can go to, to this particular uh, page and see the requirements. Um, yeah, another way is going to, there's a, I found one link that lists some funding schemes for, for postdoctoral fellowships. You can also go to this link. Um, sorry, the fourth one, which is based on my experience. So when I'm about to graduate, my advisor at that time, he told me that Sebastian, there is a professor in Michigan looking for postdoc, why don't you apply for this? So, okay, I follow. Uh, his suggestions, and then I applied to this uh, postdoctoral position, and here I am. Uh, application package is uh, pretty standard. You need to send CV, statement of interest, transcripts, and letters of recommendations. Um, yeah, so uh, hopefully you will get some interviews. So in my experience, um, I was interviewed with two co-PIs for this project. For visa type, um, in addition to F1 and J1 visa, uh, there's also another type of visa. It's called H1B visa, which is the standard uh, working visa in the US. So it depends on, on the advisor, on the university, which type of visa that you get. So since I get my degree from uh, US, then right now my visa is still F1 visa. So my research focus on uh, Dream PSC is on control and optimization of cyber physical systems. But my current research right now is more fo focused on control and optimization of power system for grid organization. So I will not explain this in detail, but uh, there are many challenges uh, in current power system in infrastructure um, due to uncertainty in renewable generation, and also the reduction of inertia. And recently we also have prosumers, which is a consumer that can also produce loads. So we challenge these issues uh, in the projects that I'm working on right now. We are focusing on um, tackling these issues through demand response program. So demand response is um, a way to change the consumer's power consumption behavior to help uh, us to match between power supply and demand. So we are using uh, PCLs like air conditioners, water heaters, and refrigerators uh, to ma manipulate the operation of these, um, uh, these uh, air conditioners to, to help us to balance power and demand. So my role is to design implementable uh, low complexity control algorithms to enable demand response on an aggregation of PCLs. So this project is currently funded by ARPA-E, which is a funding program from the Department of Energy. It's a collaboration between the University of Michigan, UC Berkeley, Los Alamos National Laboratory, and Second Street Incorporation. So uh, yeah, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Yeah.
Banyak sekali pertanyaan yang disampaikan uh, untuk uh, Mbak Novalia dan juga Mas Bastian. Uh, di sini pertanyaan-pertanyaannya adalah uh, persiapan ya. Tadi persiapannya sudah dipresentasikan konsistensi, kemudian selain motivasi, ada hal-hal yang uh, ditanyakan itu adalah kalau background risetnya tidak sama, apa yang harus disiapkan? Seperti misalnya Mbak Nova ternyata apply juga untuk bidang-bidang yang ternyata eh, di Singapura pernah eh, mengerjakan sesuatu yang tidak related, tapi ternyata pas ya. Kemudian juga Mas Sebastian juga tadi menginspirasi tentang bagaimana untuk eh, mendapatkan potensi-potensi itu. Jadi bagaimana persiapannya untuk bidang yang tidak sejenis, yang ternyata masih inline ya untuk fat to reach the postdoctoral fellow-nya. Hmm, sebenarnya sih kan seber, uh, banyak uh, technical skill-nya kan sebenarnya sama walaupun topiknya berbeda um, dan biasanya semua itu bisa dipelajari. Jadi kalau biasanya asumsi para profesornya adalah jika kamu udah punya uh, udah ditrain melalui uh, dengan the PhD, biasanya sih um, mempelajari hal yang baru itu juga seharusnya nggak um, susah. Jadi intinya kayak you know what people always said that Uh, the university and the uh, throughout, you know, like your S1 and S2 or S3, exactly uh, teaching you how to learn. So I guess like it's more about that. Their assumption is that you will be able to learn something new uh, wherever you are, uh, especially if you have shown that you can uh, you can publish papers and like have a lot of good output. They will, I think, most likely the professor will not have doubt that you could do the same in even it's a new topic but it's a but usually like the professors are like the one as well as and also other speakers have said that like um it depends on what the professor wants from you as well like for example misalnya profesornya mungkin juga mau expand technical skill in the lab dengan your own technical skill then it doesn't really matter kayak backgroundnya mungkin agak berbeda atau gimana i think as far as uh, mau belajar bisa lah iya <laughs> yeah. Asal yang penting mau belajar pasti bisa ya semangatnya. Gimana dengan Mas Bastian? Oh ya, yeah. um, so research yang sekarang ini kan lebih ke power system. Cuma latar belakang saya itu control system. Jadi ini kan beda yang mirip electrical engineering. Cuma nggak sama ya, nggak sama, sama. Jadi jadi saya kira kesempatan saya di sini cukup unik karena kebetulan um, profesor yang menangani riset saya sekarang ini memang mencari control system engineers untuk aplikasi di power system. Jadi sebenarnya cuma masalah kita tuh sebenarnya cocok untuk berkontribusi di proyek ini apa enggak gitu. Iya. Yeah. Jadi sebenarnya PI atau profesor itu mencari posisi karena mereka punya proyek khusus dan memerlukan keahlian kita. Jadi kalau mau coba cari bidang lain ya cari bidang lain yang mana kita tuh punya background di situ mungkin aplikasinya di bidang lain yang kita mau tuju. Iya, jadi konsistensi untuk menguasai kompetensi sesuai dengan bidang dan juga mempelajari sesuatu yang potensi untuk mendukung PI kita ya, dilihat dari track recordnya. Pertanyaan yang menarik juga ini mengenai output dari postdoctoral program ya. Untuk tahun pertama, tahun kedua, tahun ketiga seperti Mbak Novalia itu langsung kontrak lima tahun dan ternyata ada hurufnya ya setiap tahun sekuensnya ada outputnya sangat terukur sekali. Eh, bagaimana caranya merencanakan agar output itu sesuai dengan yang eh, direncanakan khususnya untuk yang research publication. Publication is not easy ya, it is a long way eh, to publish. Tapi bagaimana caranya agar bisa on track? Well, uh, I guess work hard. I mean, uh, what on? I mean, like work hard and work smart. Uh, jadi kayak you need to know. Uh, you need to like really systematically plan your days and like you know also have like a plan for like month uh, or yearly what you want to accomplish, um, and work with people. Uh, and then get people to like, oh, like, you know, I have students, I have like collaborators and so on. Jadi kayak ya kerja dengan banyak orang dan uh, 
have a plan about like what you would like to do uh, and how you're going to do it, Jidi. Uh, well, start with, um, I have like a gigantic Google calendar, I guess. And that's a, that's a good start to like put everything together and have a very uh, well-planned conversations with your faculty member, uh, with the PI, for example. So be proactive about what you want, you know, have a good planning and ultimately is uh, truly have a good plan and you need to know like what you are signing up for. Jadi kayak seperti all of the speakers have said, you know, when you are picking a faculty member, you need to know what kind of projects they have and how do they uh, treat their students or their trainees. And I think that's very important to like make sure that things are aligned so that you can be as productive as you could be. Mm -hmm. Amazing, yeah. Mas Bastian gimana? Kalau persiapan, um, saya kira uh, pretty standard ya. Jadi kita harus sebenarnya postdoc itu untuk untuk apa gitu kan? Kita terus motivasinya apa sih? Kalau kalau saya explore different field. Jadi supaya postdocnya tidak sia-sia ya kita harus punya rencana yang jelas dan alasan yang cukup cukup masuk akal ya. Kenapa kita mau postdoc? Karena itu. Um, tidak lebih mudah daripada PhD ya. Jadi kalau mau pasti kita harus benar punya punya niat yang yang bagus, punya motivasi yang bagus dan resilience gitu. Ya, eh, pengalaman dari riset yang sudah dilakukan khusus untuk yang riset commercialization-nya. Bagaimana antara menghindarkan konflik eh, copyright antara pemberi eh, dana dengan eh, hasil yang kita temukan? Nah, sampai sejauh mana hal itu eh, dilakukan? Oh, I think that uh, setiap institusi punya regulasi masing-masing dan mereka juga punya uh, office yang menghandle kayak project ini. Kalau misalnya kita menerima funding dari private institution, uangnya untuk di, 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 dibuat apa kan ada regulasinya. Jadi udah dari awal udah benar-benar di, uh, dikomunikasikan bagaimana uh, penggunaan uang tersebut untuk uh, project apa. Jadi dan kalau misalnya government funding usually uh, kayak NIH funding itu usually they don't really care what you use it for. They are usually much uh, even ketika terjadi ada komersialisasi enggak enggak ada ownership from the NIH themselves. Uh, jadi dan juga kalau misalnya mau mengkomersialisasikan uh, project contohnya misalnya membikin uh, biotech company startup or something like that uh, actually the institution themselves uh, we need uh, even if you are the 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 walaupun uh, misalnya saya yang uh, inventor of the technology i cannot just uh, get it and then like start something actually there is negotiation and also like there is a um, licensing and stuff that we have to uh, follow through and go through uh, with the institusi di mana riset itu dikerjakan jadi ada the proper line uh, network and everything that we have to go through. Uh, jadi, uh, we have lawyers and, and both sides and everything to make sure that uh, it is clean, kosher, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Nah, ini pengalaman ya, bagaimana uh, untuk pengelola program postdoc untuk mempersiapkan secara komprehensif dari berbagai sisi, tidak hanya secara sains, tapi juga aspek manajemennya. Seperti Dr. Lu N tadi sampaikan bahwa banyak faktor untuk kelancaran program postdoc ini, bahkan untuk lawyer yang menstrukturkan mana yang menjadi hak dan kewajiban untuk penerima grant, ya, dan juga untuk awardinya juga sebagai host penyelenggara kegiatan itu. Bagaimana untuk bidang engineering dari pengalaman Mas Sebastian? Sebenarnya saya malah belajar dari Mbak Nova, ya, soalnya di sini belum sih, jadi masih dalam tahap pengembangan. Kalau proyek yang saya kerja sekarang ini masih kita masih coba eksperimen, lalu coba deploy ke real real house. Jadi rencananya kita coba tes di real environment dan kita lihat di situ kita juga uji kalau kalau berhasil sesuai uh, rencana ya kita akan melakukan teknologi transfer. Jadi mungkin arahnya ke komersialisasi, tapi itu masih nanti. Jadi saya belum ada pengalaman di situ. 
Iya, terima kasih. Ini waktu semakin cepat bergulir. Eh, Pertanyaan-pertanyaan eh, banyak sekali ya yang sudah disampaikan kepada kami pengalaman bagaimana untuk mendapatkan eh, fellow sebagai fellow untuk program postdoc yang mana eh, ini merupakan satu hal yang eh, sangat menantang sekali dan tidak ada yang tidak mungkin eh, untuk dicapai seperti yang disampaikan oleh Mbak Novalia dan juga Mas Bastian work hard, work smart, ya. kemudian opportunity eh, dimanfaatkan eh, dengan berbagai cara. Nah, saya eh, Kami ingin mengundang Bapak eh, Dwi Larso, Direktur eh, Beasiswa dari LPDP. Barangkali masih ada, Pak Dwi. Nah, eh, bila sudah eh, tidak ada, Pak Dwi... Eh, kami mengucapkan terima kasih kepada semua presenter yang hadir hari ini untuk menyampaikan sharing pengalaman untuk bagaimana mendapatkan postdoctoral fellow di di Amerika Serikat dan juga untuk mendapatkan peluang-peluang lainnya ya selain research collaboration kemudian juga mengkomersialisasi hasil riset yang ada dan juga potensi kedepannya in the future. Mungkin sebelum kita tutup, mungkin LPDP ada dari tim LPDP, mungkin Pak Dwi bila masih ada. Ya, Bu. Oh ya, Pak Dwi bagaimana rencana ke depan LPDP ini? Peluangnya tadi potensi untuk postdoc sangat besar sekali. Untuk satu institusi saja ada 700 di Harvard ya. Ini kita baru ya. satu ya. Ya kami LPDP 2022 ini memperbaiki beberapa layanannya. Ada yang khusus untuk afirmasi untuk putra putri Papua kita utamakan untuk 96 daerah afirmasi kita usahakan sosialisasi sebaik baiknya menjangkau mereka. Kemudian beberapa terkait industri hilirisasi industri sumber daya alam. Uh, ekonomi hijau uh, dan juga digital ekonomi ini kita uh, support selain tentunya kesehatan ya kesehatan ini selalu menjadi utama dan pendidikan menjadi utama maka itu kami berkolaborasi dengan Kemdikbudristek khusus untuk mendukung program-program yang di luar S2 S3 maka itu program-program postdoktoral sahabat dikeli vokasi Kampus Merdeka itu memang yang leading sektornya adalah Kemdikbudristek. LPDP mensupport ya dengan pendanaannya. Dan khusus untuk tahun ini akan ada program baru lagi namanya Pabrik Wirausaha di mana kita ingin mencetak banyak wirausaha yang berbasis perguruan tinggi. ini yang akan kita support ke depan tentunya kawan-kawan yang postdoc yang akan mengambil postdoc saya pikir tugasnya LPDP nanti merelaksasi aturan-aturan yang agar mereka bisa dimungkinkan untuk melakukan full ya postdoc dengan eh, apa izin khusus dari LPDP. Ini eh, tentunya akan kita full support eh, Bu eh, Popi. Itu eh, Mbak Novalia kita juga sering eh, diskusi ada PR-PR di kita LPDP belum bisa memenuhi karena banyak aspek lain dengan adanya BRIN segala macam saya pikir nanti Pak Wisnu, Direktur Fasilitasi Riset kita juga bisa memfasilitasi karena kapasitas kami kalau di beasiswa ya terbatas untuk memberikan beasiswa, terutama yang native LPDP kan S2, S3 ya. Sementara kita juga ingin mendukung ya startup startup baru dan ini sedang didorong juga bagaimana kita memberikannya, apakah bentuknya seed money atau kita gabungkan dengan venture capital segala macam ini tentunya akan memungkinkan juga rekan-rekan diaspora di sana untuk mencoba melihat saya baru saja di eh, apa eh, berdiskusi ya dengan salah satu BUMN di Indonesia ya saya sebut saja Bio Farma. Tentunya ke depan ini eh, bisnis-bisnis baru secara baru ini akan bermunculan yang berbasis pada industri kesehatan, <tuh> farmasi segala macam dan ini eh, mereka minta kita untuk menyiapkan putra putri terbaik bangsa baik yang alumni maupun yang sedang ongoing maupun yang akan berangkat begitu ya untuk connect dengan agenda-agenda bangsa ini terutama yang saya sedang berkoordinasi adalah dengan Bio Farma. 
Silakan rekan-rekan juga bisa kontak kami dan kami nanti juga akan sampaikan apa kebutuhan Bio Farma yang bisa didukung oleh kawan-kawan ini. Baik nanti melakukan riset dulu, postdoktora segala macam, tapi dikaitkan dengan pengembangan industri yang ada di Indonesia. Demikian Bu Bobi, terima kasih. Ya, terima kasih uh, Pak Dwi. Uh, webinar uh, How to Get a Postdoctoral Fellowship in the US is not the only one. Kita masih ada beberapa seri ke depannya untuk bidang-bidang lainnya. Untuk seri yang sekarang adalah di bidang medical dan juga engineering dan juga ada seri-seri yang lainnya. Untuk itu ditunggu ya nantikan informasi kegiatan webinar yang dikerjasamakan dengan LPDP dan Majelis Rektor Perguruan Tinggi Negeri Indonesia serta Fulbright Aminef. Saya mungkin sampaikan satu menit, Mbak Popi, aku lupa. Jadi selama ini LPDP itu fokus mencetak gelar ya, S2, S3. Saya pikir itu penting, tapi tidak cukup ya. Saya pikir kalau teman-teman bergelar apa master atau doktor, apalagi di bidang engineering, begitu ya, kesehatan, biokimia, segala macam, saya pikir ujungnya harus nempel, connect dengan industri. Jadi kami tidak puas hanya mengeluarkan output, tapi harus outcome, ya, impactnya apa. Ini yang sedang kita coba pikirkan bagaimana kita connect kawan-kawan yang punya gelar S2, S3 yang keren-keren ini bisa lang langsung impactnya dimanfaatkan oleh dunia industri maupun tentunya public sektor yang ada di Indonesia. Itu Bu Wapi, itu aja saya ingin sampaikan. Terima kasih. Ya, Terima kasih Pak Dwi, mitra kita LPDP dari Kementerian Keuangan yang terus membuka peluang-peluang uh, untuk uh, melanjutkan ya riset yang dilakukan oleh anak-anak bangsa ini. Tentunya kita memberikan applause yang luar biasa untuk uh, sosok yang sangat kita banggakan, Dr. Novalia Pisesa dan Dr. Sebastian Adi Nugroho. Terima kasih atas waktunya memberikan pencerahan, memberikan semangat uh, Uh, ada peluang yang memang bisa kita capai dengan uh, dengan uh, mengikuti uh, program postdoc ya kesempatan untuk mendapatkan pros, uh, program postdoc. Kami akan kembalikan kepada panitia untuk menayangkan uh, acara webinar yang akan dilaksanakan minggu depan. Silahkan panitia untuk uh, sharing filenya. Minggu depan. Minggu depan webinar yang akan dilaksanakan adalah untuk meningkatkan preferensi studi di Amerika Serikat bidang arsitek dan urban planning, di mana akan dihadirkan perwakilan dari University of Colorado Boulder dan dari Clemson University serta Columbia University, di mana LPDP juga uh, telah memiliki uh, mahasiswanya yang didukung oleh LPDP untuk studi di uh, Columbia University, kemudian di Clemson University dengan uh, Fulbright Dicti uh, Funding, dan juga kita akan mendengarkan bagaimana pengalaman uh, mendapatkan beasiswa dari universitas untuk studi program S3 dari University of Colorado Boulder. Jadi silahkan hadiri beasiswa ini, nanti akan ada sesi tanya-jawab yang akan dipandu oleh tim LPDP, dalam hal ini oleh Bapak Dr. Dwi Larso, untuk pendanaan studi ke Amerika Serikat, baik di bidang master dan juga program doktor dengan dana beasiswa di approved list university yang ada di LPDP. Dan seperti kita ketahui, LPDP telah membuka batch pertama 25 Februari untuk mendaftar beasiswa studi ke luar negeri, silahkan hadiri sesinya minggu depan pada tanggal dan jam yang sama, yaitu hari Rabu, tanggal 9 Maret waktu Indonesia. Dan juga akan ada presentasi pengantar dari Dirut LPDP, Bapak Andin, dan juga dibuka oleh Dubes RI untuk Amerika Serikat, Bapak Prosan Ruslani dan akan dimoderatori dari anggota Majelis Rektor PTN Indonesia dari UGM, Dr. And, uh, Imade Andi Arsana. Jadi sampai bertemu uh, minggu depan di acara uh, webinar 
bincang karya dan juga bagaimana potensi untuk meningkatkan kolaborasi riset dan pendidikan. Terima kasih. Silakan panitia untuk sesi eh, foto bersama dulu. Baik, terima kasih kepada Bapak Ibu. Dipersilakan untuk on kamera. Mari kita mulai untuk sesi foto bersama. Di sini ada 8 screen. Dimulai dari screen pertama. Selanjutnya screen kedua. Selanjutnya screen ketiga. Dipersilakan untuk on kamera. Selanjutnya, screen keempat. Screen kelima. Screen keenam. Screen ketujuh. Dan screen ke-8. Terima kasih untuk link evaluasi uh, di, sudah dikirimkan via room chat. Ya, silahkan mengisi uh, link evaluasi untuk mendapatkan sertifikat dan juga materi presentasi yang telah dipaparkan oleh uh, narasumber uh, Dr. Lu An dan Profesor Liu, serta dari Dr. Sebastian dan Dr. Novalia Sisesa. Sampai berjumpa pada acara webinar Bincang Karya Seri ke-25 minggu depan. Selamat menjalankan aktivitas. Terima kasih untuk tim LPDP. Pak Terima kasih Bu Bobi. Ya. Salam sehat semua. Novalia, Sebastian, take care. Ya. Enjoy, have fun. Ya. Ya. Terima kasih. Makasih. Terima kasih Prof. Jamal, Rektor UNS sebagai Ketua MRP TNI dan juga Profesor Asari, Rektor dari ITS dan juga eh, semuanya yang hadir. Profesor EN juga dari ISBI, terima kasih supportnya Prof. Siap Ibu, terima kasih sudah lama kita nggak ketemu. <laughs> iya Prof. EN ini luar biasa, ini kiprahnya sukses selalu ya Prof. Amin, amin, amin. Ya, ya mangga, mangga izin, Prof. Mangga.